G'day, remember me? I had a little bit of a hiatus from YouTube just because I just wanted to take photos of space uh, without filming and stuff. I just wanted to um, get back to, you know, enjoying being in the observatory. Uh, I've also been playing music and spending time with my family and drinking a lot because you always need a little break from space, otherwise you will go insane. So today I'm going to share with you 16 reasons why your astro photos suck before you even get to the post-processing stage. So every time I take a run of images I put the bad stuff into a folder called bad subs and I've been storing these away for a while I don't know why but I just thought I'd go through them and I realized that what I have is an encyclopedia of failure. I can show you each of these issues that turn up in the subs and explain why they happen and how you can avoid them. And it's by smoothing out all of those bugs first that you get the best photos possible because when you've got good data then you go to process it and it looks my name is dylan o'donnell and you're watching star stuff Before I continue, I just want to give a quick shout out to High Point Scientific. If you don't want your astro photos to suck, then High Point Scientific is a good place to start. They offer free technical support, but they also have on-hand specialists to help you get what you want out of your astronomy. They will give you that support. And they also have a price match guarantee, so you can't really get better than that. So check out High Point Scientific, link in the description below. Now hot pixels are going to happen and there isn't really much you can do to prevent that. Uh, you can prevent noise generally by making sure that it's cooler when you take the images but hot pixels are uh, for the most part dead defects on the chip so you have to deal with them in post processing. If hot pixels are way out of hand though your chip might be too far gone and the longer that time goes on uh, that camera will get worse and worse. So something to consider but not necessarily something you can prevent entirely. You see that dark circle there or in your images you might see dark streaks mm. these are dust motes and dust motes are where tiny specks of dust are on the sensor on the chip and uh, unfortunately they just block a little bit of light there so the best thing to do I feel is to actually clean the chip I think that's the easiest solution you can deal with this and vignetting with flats and flats is the solution uh, however I really prefer to clean the chip as, as long as it's clear you won't get them in the first place it's really hard to shoot when God is in your face throwing clouds through your images there's not a lot you can do about this except plan and make sure that you're shooting on a really clear night uh, if the night's cloudy like this maybe just use the night for practice tuning and other stuff because there's little you can do other than getting out of the way of the clouds or you know become a radio astronomer Now if you see something like this it's clear that something has gone wrong and more often than not it's actually vibration. Uh, it could be you stepping around, it could be traffic, it could be uh, movement on the block that you're on, Any, it could be any source of vibration. Uh, I've even had uh, times where a counterweight has slipped and caused vibration as well so it can be vibration in your system as well. Uh, something that you can do to help prevent that other than get away from the source of the vibration is to use vibration suppression pads on your telescope tripod uh, and you can even make these yourself. Now this sub actually looks pretty good until you get close and then you notice that the stars are sort of egg shaped. Now if you notice that the uh, shape of the egg or the direction of the egg is always in one direction or if it's severe enough that the star is actually like a stripe uh, then you know you've got drift somewhere in your system. Uh, this could be flexure which is a difference between the uh, guide scope and the main telescope not being parallel enough uh, or it could be that your polar alignment is actually out and you're not guiding properly and guiding will normally compensate for this but another reason I've seen that causes this at least for me is uh, a gentle breeze uh, we always have a gentle breeze coming in one direction because we're on the coast so that means we consistently get uh, this kind of drift always in the same direction uh, so wind can be another factor there it's not necessarily 
actually drifting, it's just pushing those stars into that egg shape. So there's a few things to consider there with drift. It was actually super embarrassing going through all my old shots from years ago and realizing just how bad some of them were. Uh, you can see in this sub that it's so out of focus that when you look at the stars, they're actually ring shaped. You can see that you can see that donut shaped star. Um, and that's something you can really easily check, not even with robotic focusing or anything like that, just manually, just making sure that the star is pinpoint when you do your focus routine. Of course, uh, any kind of focuser helps, whether it's um, a motorized focuser using the um, HFR half flux radius method uh, visually, or and using the um, do-it-yourself feather touch focuser, which I have in another video. But there is nothing worse than finishing a run and looking at the data that night or the next day and realizing that the whole thing was out of focus. So definitely, definitely check this one. And of course, every now and then you're gonna have one of these where a satellite just zips through the image and pretty much ruins it. Um, of course, Elon Musk has just started the Starlink network, which is going to have many tens of thousands of satellites destroying our images like this and some people believe that because we know the ephemeris of the satellite we can preemptively remove them from the data and that's that's not really true uh, that's just like using the heal or the uh, clone tool in photoshop and just uh, removing it based on the pixels nearby it's not truly uh, preserving that data at all uh, really my advice is to just throw it away you can try and stack it and maybe if you have enough exposures it'll leave a little ghost trail it will get rid of most of it but if I've got enough exposures, I just get rid of the ones that have these streaks through them and uh, the stack will turn out perfect. So when you go through your exposures, you'll find that there's going to be some where the stars just aren't round. Maybe the, the scope sort of dipped a bit during the exposure or wasn't bang on or the stars kind of bloat or get unbalanced like this. So it's worthwhile going through and just throwing out these if you can. Really the purpose of getting so much data to stack into an image is half because of the signal to noise stuff but it's also lucky imaging it's also the idea that you get rid of all of these ones that didn't work so that your stack is made from the best possible stuff anyway so if you see unbalanced stars or stars that bloated in one exposure but not the next just throw out all the worst frames like this It's hard to overstate just how important collimation is, especially on a schmidt cassegrain telescope. Uh, when you're taking images and you see that in, in this case, the primary mirror reflection of Alnitac there, uh, it's not even. Uh, and that's because it's out of collimation. And this is even more obvious in this second one where you see that the stars are out of focus and out of collimation as well. And they turn into these little seagull type uh, pointed and wispy on one side it's uh it's really awful and so if you see this in your images just stop straight away because you need to go through the collimation routine before you go any further there's no fixing this in post this is something you have to fix at the telescope now i hate diffraction spikes anyway uh they're an optical aberration they're not real they're not part of the real view of the star um, so there's not a lot you can do about this depending on your telescope's construction if you're using a uh, Schmidt Cassegrain then you're not going to get big diffraction spikes but if you're using a refractor you are or, if, or rather uh, something with an internal obstruction I should say um, they can be sort of cool looking on clusters, but in this case I'm shooting an F2 and that diffraction spike is because of the cable hanging at the front of the OTA. So what I should have done is hung the cables at right angles to get nice four pointed dif diffraction spikes. Now it's subjective, this looks sort of cool anyway, but depending on how you want your diffraction spikes to turn out and how the image is gonna look and how it's gonna be oriented, you might wanna work out how you want those diffraction spikes to look and adjust your cables or uh, your telescope accordingly. Now if you're shooting against the moon obviously you're going to get these sorts of gradients and you're going to lose some signal but in here specifically I'm talking about local light pollution so I'm talking about 
uh, your neighbor's lights. I'm talking about a street light just across the street. Really uh, local sources of light that are going straight into your gear. Uh, these can cause some pretty severe gradients and reduction of signal that's really hard to clean up in post. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of barrier between you and the light pollution. Uh, a dew shield is really good for getting rid of a lot of that. And um, if you can take yourself away to a dark sky or maybe take the fuse out of the street light right next to your observatory, then uh, that can help too. I've got to be honest, I'm not super clear what went wrong in either of these two shots, but uh, it's clear that whatever's going on is fairly mechanical. We've got straight lines and we've got uh, that sort of 90 degree angle in that main image. Uh, which suggests that it could be something to do with the guiding. It could be a guide, a complete guide configuration error. It could be that it lost the guide star and has been trying to slew back when it refound it. Maybe a cloud uh, went over it, lost it, and then moved and then tried to get it back again when it came back. So that can cause all kind of funky uh, angles and lines and stuff in your image. So uh, if that's happening in one of your long exposures, just uh, just give up wait for the clouds to go make sure you got guiding and guide star are all locked on and try try again so this is the uh, north american nebula as uh, seen from my backyard in australia and i don't know what i was thinking uh with the 60 second exposure there is no way i'm going to pick up enough signal to to build this up unless i get a lot a lot of data and um, stretch it really hard in post it's going to be a a tough sell so low signal really all you can do is make sure that the target is as high as possible when you shoot it and go for the longer exposures as well especially if it's a very faint faint target uh, but uh, an image with such low signal like this is probably not worthwhile so it's best to go for those longer exposures if you can so depending on your workflow and whether you have a um, an actual rotator which not a lot of people tend to have uh, when you are building up an image from several runs, so you're doing your luminance, you're doing RGB and that sort of thing, when you go to put it all together and you register those stars together, if one of your layers is off, you could end up with a misalignment which really threatens the entire project. Uh, if it's just a small corner, you can sort of uh, heal it out in Photoshop or something, but if it's something as severe as this, it's not really fixable. So when if you do have to go back and night after night you're trying for the same target make sure that your rotation is perfect from night to night so you don't waste that data okay so this is actually pretty interesting this is um what happens if you use a narrowband filter in this case hydrogen alpha with a color camera uh, which you're not supposed to do uh, you'd be an idiot like me to try and do something like this uh, but you can see there when you zoom into the stars so you can see that there's this grid where really the uh, red pixels are picking up the signal mostly and the G and the B ones uh, are not. Uh, but it actually looks pretty cool I've got to say there's still some bleed from the filter through to all the pixels so you do get a pretty good resolution image. Um, it's definitely not as clean as using a mono camera. Uh, but generally this is not something you want to do. I just included this just in case you are trying to use a narrowband filter with a one-shot color. And I mean a single pass, not one of those cool filters that have three uh, band passes on a single one to hit each of the RGB pixels. Uh, generally, this is not something you want to do. So you might have seen something like this on one of your images, uh, and I've had many people ask me about stuff like this, uh, because when you see it for the first time, you think, what is this crazy object in space? Uh, but really what it tends to be is an internal light reflection in your OTA when light's bouncing around on the mirror or on the sides and you end up with this funky focused thing on the sensor. It's not real, it's not from space, it's just a weird reflection. Uh, now this can sometimes happen when light from a nearby street light or something is bouncing in from the side on an angle, but it can also be from a bright star. And I actually think this one is from Alnatak, which is sort of off to the left out of frame here. Uh, it's such a bright star that uh, it itself being off center is causing this reflection inside the telescope as well. And that's a pretty hard thing to deal with, but 
do make sure you've got a dew shield just in case it is external. And if you do have a bright point source like Alnatec, sometimes it's easier just to put it in the middle. Well, hopefully that helped. They say you should learn from your mistakes, but you know what's better? Learning from other people's mistakes. Be sure to subscribe. I do these videos on a regular basis and hopefully they'll help improve your astrophotography. And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Don't forget high point scientific.